Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the Wonder at Home webinar series. It's certainly so great to be with you all today. My name is Marla Franco, and I serve as the Assistant Vice Provost for Hispanic Serving Institution Initiatives at the University of Arizona. I also serve as an affiliate faculty with the Center for the Study of Higher Education within the University of Arizona's College of Education. I'm super pleased to be with you all today. Um, and although we are not on our beautiful campus at the moment, we are reminded that the University of Arizona resides on the ancestral homelands of the Thonotham and Pascoyaki peoples. Thank you so much for being here today. We certainly have an amazing lineup to be joining us to talk about today's topic. As you know, today's topic is focused on the digital divide in education in particular. And I'm so excited that each of our panelists today really brings to light and provides a very unique an important perspective that reveals some of the grave inequities experienced by some of our most vibrant yet underserved communities. There are likely many reasons that you all are joining us today for today's webinar. And I have to say that today's topic really hits home for me personally. Uh, this spring, uh, I had an eighth grader and a fifth grader at home. And and their unique learning needs made this a very challenging time for them and our household. Not to mention the University of Arizona and our local school districts quickly had to pivot to distance learning in early March. I know that our students, faculty, K through 12 educators, support staff and families all struggled through this adjustment and certainly more, some more than others. During today's panel discussion, you will hear from some of my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Sungae Hong, Associate Professor of Disability and Psychoeducational Studies. Dr. Steve Holmes, Superintendent of Sunnyside Unified School District and proud UA alumnus. And Enrique Salt, Project Coordinator of the Indigenous Teacher Education Program. Now, let me share with you a little bit about how our time this afternoon will be spent. Each of the panelists will provide a, a brief introduction for us, and then we plan to use really the remainder of the time to engage some of the questions that many of you submitted when you RSVP for today's webinar. Uh, so we'll use those to kick off some really important discussion points after the introductions. Uh, throughout the discussion, uh, you can actually submit questions and comments using the Q&A function uh, right at the, the bottom. I will certainly monitor those as they come in and we'll use them to help further guide our conversation this afternoon. We'll then wrap up the webinar with just some final thoughts uh, from our panelists um, and we'll certainly kind of thank you all for joining us. But Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Hong, our first pa panelist. Dr. Hong? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sungae Hong, uh, and I'm the unit chair of the special education of the Department of Disability and Psychoeducational Studies here at the University of Arizona. Simply put, the digital divide um, poses a lot of challenges in this uh, pandemic um, for students uh, with disabilities. I am uh, running a, a um, national science funded uh, project called uh, Project Poem that's uh, to uh, motivate, motivate students with visual impairments towards STEM learning. When this coronavirus pandemic uh, has impacted our lives and uh, um, the university decided to cancel uh, its uh, in-person meetings and on-campus gatherings. Our project has been greatly uh, impacted by the decision because we had a couple of summer camps uh, designated for students with visual impairments. It required um, 
changes and the modifications so that the participants in the project could take part in more efficiently, but at this at the same time, maintaining the same level of learning. So like our project that was greatly impacted um, by uh, this uh, coronavirus, I expect that um, many of us who are working for students with the disabilities, including teachers, student themselves, and uh, other agencies and the professional around the country are being impacted. And so today I'd like to uh, share some thoughts and ideas with you about ways that we can understand the gaps existing with regards to um, access and accessibility technology and uh, instruction and teaching during the uh, process of uh, this transition to um, to deal with uh, you know the circumstance, but at the same time to think about ways that we can make uh, this opportunity uh, as uh, a possible revenue for uh, coming up with uh, more accessible, more innovative um, ways to uh, provide instructions and uh, services to students with disabilities. So I look forward to uh, hearing from you and share my thoughts with you. In that, I'd like to um, give uh, the microphone to uh, Mr. Steve Holmes, who is the superintendent of the Sunnyside School District. Good afternoon. Um, pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues and panelists um, this afternoon to discuss this important topic. In the Sunnyside Unified School District, our district uh, about 10 years ago decided to take on this challenge of the digital divide by really embracing um, getting laptops into the hands of students. It's been about eight years now that every fourth grader through 12th grader in our district actually has a laptop that they take home daily and has become an integral part of how we deliver learning and teaching in our district. As such, when the pandemic happened, I believe we're much uh, positioned much better off than other local districts to actually address some of the remote learning needs that um, were necessary to continue uninterrupted learning services to students. Uh, one of the things that we're most proud of is if you look at the community that we serve in, um, we're about 86% of our students uh, receive free and reduced lunch. So we're considered a high poverty district serving the super majority who are our Latinx students here. Uh, I'm very proud that we're able to offer that type of services, particularly when it comes to digital services. Um, and our engagement numbers really were remarkably different than what you would see in similar communities as districts were struggling to um, go remotely. Um, our numbers were significantly higher and I'd like to take a little bit of time today to share a little bit more about why I believe that happened and more importantly, some of the work that still we need to do what's ahead of us as we um, look to what learning in the future looks like. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Q, who's a project coordinator for our Indigenous Teacher Education Program in the Arizona uh, College of Education. Uh, greetings, everyone. Look at the initial. I should hear Bush's chain, but I need to say, I don't put a chain in the chanel. There, I provided my four clans that serves as my identity and my credentials passed down to me from my ancestors, grandparents, parents, and which is now my responsibility to push on to my future generations to strengthen our knowledge and ways of being an educator, a philosopher, an artist, and a healer. So, diving right into it, what is the biggest digital divide here. As indigenous people, we have to leave home to pursue education, higher education, and in order to properly engage with that, we also need access to technology. I always said leaving home. <clears throat> but we leave home to do good things, a lot of beautiful things. And so in this digital divide, we have recognized 
to acknowledge our emotional, spiritual, and mental well being, not only of our students, but our communities, faculty, staff, um, and our Wildcat community and all communities. One of our ways of navigating these challenging times is our way of our exchange in our stories and oral stories because these help us navigate challenging situations. As you see here, we don't always have a class, especially now. We don't have access to internet, to strong cell range. So for me, I went home for a week and worked from home and this was my mobile working desk. Some of the challenges that I dealt with were, where's the Wi-Fi? What type of transportation did I need? What were the weather conditions? What were the temperatures? And then what was my technology's capacity? And if that was what I was questioning, what were our students questioning and what more questions did they have? One of the beautiful things about this digital divide that I see too is the creation of agency. Many individuals reaching out, asking how may we support indigenous communities? I have these resources, let's work together. So in that way we created collective solidarity. And we all feel it, the emotions, and this is what helps us get us through as indigenous communities and all peoples is this good medicine of laughter. Thank you all who are coming. I'm Indrika K. Salt, and feel free to ask me as many questions as you would like. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our panelists for those introductions. We certainly look forward to engaging some of the questions to help us take a, a deeper dive. Um, and on that note, I'd actually like to start off our questions with Dr. Hong. Um, if you could tell us, you know, what does the digital divide look like for students with disabilities? So the one on parents um, aspects um, of the digital divide or the, the gap lies in the physical access. That is looking at the um, statistical um, data, uh, little over 50% of uh, people with disabilities have uh, access to internet, whereas little over 80% of general household in the United States mm -hmm. have access to internet. So there apparently is the gap in terms of the, the, the number of uh, access or the way that people access to internet. But I guess the, the gap in that aspect probably is a little easier to address, or at least we know where that is compared to the societal um, gap um, that's existing. Uh, in April, we've seen that the Congress was um, discussing to pass the um, coronavirus um, legislation and uh, um, you know, support uh, for people in the various sectors of the society. Now, during the um, discussion of the bill, there was a request to um, waive the rights of students with disabilities that are being um, implemented through the law called IDEA or Individualized uh, Disabilities Acts in a sense that some of these rights are very difficult to implement um, during the transition to, um, to uh, digital instruction or online destruction. Therefore, some experts and uh, uh, representatives requested that such rights would uh, be waived. Now, I think this is a very huge problem or at least shows the uh, existing uh, problem in our society. During the time of this online and digital access, I think those people who do have um, bigger challenges got to be protected and got to be supported, not to be pushed outside and are forgotten. So in that sense, I think um, we got to think about how we would be able to best support our students, uh, parents, and teachers, especially, with the use of um, possible framework and resources like uh, universal design and learning, where we would be able to make the instruction better fit with the individual needs um, of the student with disabilities, and also to um, provide better uh, 
support and resources for physical accessibility of online instruction and also provide support and resources to teachers so that they can better respond and get prepared to work with their students and parents. I hope this answers. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Hong, for sharing a little bit more and, and really illustrating through some examples ways in which, um, especially during COVID-19, ways in which this has been even more challenging for the student community. So certainly thank you for raising our awareness and understanding of, of what that's been like. Um, Q, I'll, uh, you know, ask you somewhat of a comparable question. You know, what does the digital divide look like for tribal nations in Arizona? And I certainly want to thank you so much for sharing, um, you know, your your video and just some of the raw emotion, um, as well as some of the visuals that you shared with us uh, in your introduction. But if you wouldn't mind telling us more. Thank you. Uh, so going back, if you recall the image of the fireplace, there are four ways of teachings, practices, and going about life. And all of that embodies our oral story teachings. And what does the digital divide look like for tribal nations in Arizona? And for me, from the upbringing I was brought up from, is looking at that lens of hojon ashado, of harmony and beauty. So I'd first like to start off the beauty of it. More of our communities are practicing planting, traditional foods, harvesting. They're increasing their awareness of their conception. They're being more mindful to decrease their uh, a carbon footprint. The elders and the little ones are having more time to exchange their breath. Bodies are strengthening by navigating the land, whether that's herding sheep or riding the horses, are working with our animals, our livestock. There's more storytelling, more weaving, more basketry, more of our data design items that we're starting to see more transparent. That's not to exclude the challenges our nations are experiencing. Navajo Nation, San Carlos are being hit hard, increasing rates. Not only those two tribes, Tanatham, but all the 22 tribes in Arizona and over the 572 federally recognized tribes in Arizona. But what we see is we're going back to our storytellings. We're starting to have that integration. But every community change is different depending on the landscape, the geographical location. Whether we have an urban or rural nations, situations may range from a decline in the classroom attendance because students have no technology or access to technology to being sent homework packages, which do not include cultural, traditional and language integration and more of those Western standards too as well. So there I was able to kind of provide more of the beauty way, but also the challenges. And the reason why I can't help but think that way is because in our oral stories, we have monsters that continue to live today. And those monsters that our deities left in place were to keep humanity um, in check, I guess you could say. That's old age, poverty, lice, and hunger. Lice can be seen as viruses. And that's one of the monsters we're dealing with today. And it's allowing us to go back, not to our ways, but also blend that with our generations who will carry innovative ideas. Yeah. Thank you so much, Q, for, I think, really providing a, a balanced perspective um, as you responded, illustrating both the balance between the beauty of what it's created as, as well as the challenges. So thank you so much for your candidness there. Um, Dr. Holmes, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you know, during prior discussions that we've had, you know, you've stated that the digital divide is more than just a laptop and access to the internet. Can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts around that? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Frankel. Some of the things that we've been working uh, here in our district is to push against a historical institutional value system of education that very much um, is, had been alive and well in, in uh, districts that look like ours, quite frankly. And those are the value systems of, of conformity, of compliance, of completion, and valuing those types of things really has created very enabling classroom environments in our schools. 
Um, as we've been working against that, we've been really thinking a lot about the constructs of identity, purpose, and agency. Um, and within this uh, concept of agency, we've been seeing some changes in the roles that the students play in their own learning and pushing away from a highly dependent teacher-driven classroom where students actually know a lot more than the assumptions we make about our, ch our children. And so when I think about this in a techn technological space, um, some of those hold true, particularly if those types of values are, are part of the learning process that students are used to. And so as we move into this space, whether it be continuing the, or on and off because of this uh, pandemic, uh, we have to be cognizant of how much are we enabling that type of learning to be highly dependent on the teacher. Because what we find is that we want our students to have the agency skills necessary to actually work and do the work on their own and not be highly dependent in, in this space. We, we found that some of that work in the classrooms where we saw that play out, we saw a lot better engagement with students. And more importantly, we saw very little direction that needed to be given because students already knew what was expected of them. Um, so we, we, I feel that as, as we're transitioning or continue to work in this space, we gotta really be thoughtful about the conditions for learning that we've established traditionally in our schools? And do they necessarily transfer well into an online space? And I, I can tell you that as we challenge this learning journey in our, for our students as they're transitioning to the University of Arizona, that's something that continues to um, be part of our conversations. What are those skills that are to be necessary as they transition to the University, University of Arizona, which are not unlike the skills that are necessary for a kindergartner, right, as they're working in an, online space. I think we, we, we think of this very developmentally, when in reality, I, I think it, it's, it's concepts that we have to work towards at every grade level and begin to um, make sure that we, we break away from the idea that um, our, 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 our uh, students are empty vessels, right? Uh, they really are rich with a lot of knowledge that we have to embrace and find out how they're, um, what they know and how that knowledge transfers into their own um, set of um, pathway for learning. Yeah, no, really great points, great observations, um, and certainly appreciate the acknowledgement as well about having that asset-based perspective about our students um, and how much they really bring to the table um, when they come to, um, you know, our systems of education and, and the values and practices and knowledges that they come with. So thank you. Um, Dr. Hong, uh, let's turn it back over to you. Um, you know, in, of course, in light of, of COVID-19, you know, what do you think are some of the professional development and training needs that could really support special education teachers in facilitating quality remote learning? So one of the key challenges um, posed by uh, coronavirus has that we didn't have much of lead time to get prepared for this transition to online instruction. Um, for example, one of the related service um, called Orientation and Mobility. Um, this is a, um, a group of professionals who are you know, prepared to teach travel skills for students with visual impairments. So, um, Students are learning how to use um, white cane. They learn how to use navigate some um, traffic signals and sound and so forth. Think for a moment, um, how challenge would it be for you to teach someone remotely and to properly move your arm and to control the, uh, you know, a white cane to detect obstacles? And apparently there is a, um, a difference or somehow, you know, a little more unique approach in probably verbally describing the actions, but also create some, uh, you know, a uh, uh, learning opportunity that is meaningful to the child. And so in, in, uh, in the middle of all these of innovation and uh, um, thinking creatively, there are the teachers. So it will be very important that the special education teachers, but also the classroom teachers, the general education um, teachers, 
would understand the value uh, of um, diverse representation to minimize the gap. In other words, we cannot simply create one and simple uh, PowerPoint uh, that's uh, meaningful to all learners. We probably need to think about what will be the mode of representation of our knowledge, especially when it's applicable through online, that it would uh, be meaningful to each of our individual students. You know, some of those students are students with disabilities, and there are other students who are non-disabled. So in that regard, uh, the professional development program will need to emphasize the importance of the um, unique learning needs of all learners. You know, whether that's a, a student with visual impairments, hearing impairments, um, and or other types of disabilities. So all of these types of um, unique approaches, you know, whether it's utilizing, uh, you know, tactile graphics or utilizing uh, other multiple sensory channels, the teachers uh, need to be provided with resources and also support uh, from their university programs as part of their pre-service training, but also as an in-service, um, you know, as they are to navigate um, with this um, uh, time of pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hong. Those are really good points. Uh, I really appreciate, you know, certainly your remarks about the importance for training, certainly investing in our educators so that you know, they really become stewards of designing inclusive experiences um, and learning environments for our students. So thank you. Um, Q, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. You know, so um, as your program prepares indigenous uh, teachers to work with indigenous students, um, what skills become really essential for these teachers when facilitating indigenous curriculum and pedagogy? Uh um, right off the back. So that translates to kinship, relationship, how you identify to one another, how you engage with one another. Um, and that's all embodying respect, reciprocity, understanding, knowing what it means to stand in collective solidarity, um, and the hunger to integrate uh, our nations, their traditional cultural and language components, not only into curriculum, um, but their classrooms, and to also embody it with all engagements beyond five-fingered beings, so our environment. And, you know, to be able to get there, it takes a lot of unpacking as an individual, and so that's what our Indigenous Teacher Education Project assists our ITEP teacher candidates to navigate through. Um, and the way we are able to strengthen our future teachers in that manner is teaching by promoting and privileging Indigenous knowledges, values, and the language. So I guess one example is not only bringing in our Western PhD science holders, but also our community PhD holders, our elders, our herbalists, our medicine people, so that we have a balanced curriculum to engage our students that's relevant to our tribal nations. The other component is we see our teachers as nation builders in Indian country, indigenous communities. Nation building is at the forefront. How do we strengthen our communities to be livable communities for our youth and future generations to return to rather than moving to urbanized areas or places that are not their original homes? So how do we turn, return back home? Another component of also developing their critical thinking skills um, through culturally sustaining pedagogies. So you saw I um the eh that ego, all those ways of sharing and exchanging knowledges and embodying that to interact with their little ones, our kiddos. And above all, when we are interacting is being inclusive of our environment, all living species. So being able to come from that environmental, social justice centered education approach 
And from that, we're instilling awareness within our little ones to be observant of what's going on in their communities. They already know what's going on, whether that's pollution, whether that's trash, whether that's um, inadequate, inadequate remediation of mining or other corporations coming in and disturbing the lands. But because our youth see that they have innovative, creative ideas to share these solutions, and that's where our teachers come in as a key player to mediate, to provide our youth, their kiddos, that voice. I'm observing this issue, but I also see the solution here too as well. And being able to um, unpack their individual history entails having to reflect back on Western history, on first contact, the last 542 years, to recognize the purpose of assimilation and oppression through education or boarding schools by being removed from our homelands. And again, as you're going back to that video, now I had asked to our ITEP teachers in class, our, does Western institution properly prepare our teachers to handle and navigate emotional situation? That answer was no. But when we embody our indigenous ways of knowing, it's a holistic approach that has to be inclusive, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so moving forward, one of the inequities that's surfacing is the lack to acknowledge our emotional, spiritual, and mental states. So that's one of the things I'm starting to see come out of this COVID-19 that we need to be mindful of. Um, and in preparing indigenous nations, every tribal nation is different. Every tribal nation comes with different government structures. So you really have to be informed as teachers, as educators, what are those protocols, not only Western protocols, but what are their indigenous communities protocols of eh, relation, interacting and starting those relationships to be healthy and positive moving forward. Ahead. Thank you, Q. I, I certainly appreciate you. Uh, it almost kind of connects with uh, what Dr. Holmes was mentioning earlier, but but really, I think a, a holistic approach um, in thinking about ways to kind of mitigate um, the divide and some of the equity. It's not, it doesn't all, it doesn't all come down to technology and Wi-Fi access, but it also uh, certainly needs to encompass uh, a worldview of holistic support to really support students and, and educators. So Thank you for really demonstrating that through your uh, illustration and example. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Holmes. Um, you know, there seem to be some notions out there that, that youth were disengaged with remote learning, but you suggest otherwise. Uh, can you share a little bit more about that with us? Sure, just a, a couple um, thoughts on that. One is, um, one of the things we did early on is, is push hard against this idea that our students um, uh, assumptions about disengagement, that our students were just not as responsible or, you know, weren't working as hard. Right. And that seems to be the default kind of uh, idea or concept that is it plays into, I think, some educators as they're some students are disengagement. I think we, we, we started really calling out what we felt were some of those factors that influence um, what is perceived as disengagement and, and what what came out is, is, is really, really clear to us, which is, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but where in, in classrooms where there was a strong relationship between the student and the teacher, guess what? Those students were very engaged, right? As a primary foundation to this idea of this engagement was what relationship that you have before with the student and highly unlikely in this online space, um, they're going to be engaged and we found many students who had concerns with certain certain teachers um they weren't showing up on the zoom calls right there so so we had an opportunity to talk a little more in detail around some of those factors and not blaming the student but taking more of a reflective position on it where what is it that i could have done or should have done better prior it would have kind of led to greater engagement um and then equally important as we had those conversations with, was to have a real strong discussion around the conditions for learning. We talk a lot about the importance of the conditions for learning in the classroom. Uh, it's equally important to talk about the conditions for learning for our students. And sometimes those conditions for learning are not the, the, the greatest, right? Particularly if they're home and they're all trying to share internet or 
Um, they're with people they, students are with people they don't like, right? I mean, that's the reality. And so that level of empathy was part of our ongoing dialogue with our teachers. We have great educators who, who them just collegially were pushing on each other, which I felt was really powerful in this space. Um, but the second point, uh, in an, uh, uh, the second point of around disengaged youth is we also found a potential bright spot in, uh, in our middle schools. Um, we found that some of our students who were disengaged actually during school time were actually more engaged in this online space. And so there, there's something there that um, potentially could help us fix middle schools. Middle schools, I think most of us educators wanna just skip middle school and do elementary and then go to high school uh, because it's a challenging adolescent grade level for both parents and, and teachers to do middle school. You know, they're, they're amazing. I mean, they, they, they know those challenges. That being said, it's something nationally that we haven't necessarily figured out. I think there's a range of schools that do better at that level. Um, but I think in this space, we've learned something that we're very interested in, in, in um, researching a little bit more about. I, can believe, I believe it can actually change the way in which students engage at that level. Um, and it was, it was both surprising um, and then equally important, an, a, another opportunity that we saw that could really fundamentally change the way we, we do school. Yeah, thank you so much for offering those observations. I, I think you're you're definitely spot on about just um, you know the importance of that uh, teacher student relationship and and how indicative it was um, in transferring over to how well the learning environment went and the level of engagement uh, when it went virtual. So uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm actually going to turn it back over to to Dr. Hong. Um, you know, in, in light of, of continued implications of COVID-19 and what each of you have, have certainly specifically shared during this webinar, you know, what do you think the future of teaching and learning looks like based on, on what you've shared with us today? So whether we enjoy or not, I think um, this change and the transition that we have made um, to the digital um, and online instruction will be with us even after um, the, uh, the coronavirus um, is ended. And therefore, I think um, we all need to be getting prepared uh, to deal with uh, such transition. In doing so, I think it's uh, very critical for us to think about probably the three key aspects of such transition, which applies to today where we are, but also is applicable for tomorrow um, in the future when, you know, some of the, um, the impacts of the coronavirus is, uh, is, is away. The first thing is the safety of our students. In that regards, the um, internet um, and online places can become pretty dangerous um, place um, for many students. And especially our students with the disabilities can become much more vulnerable with uh, some, you know, um, scam and or other ways to, um, you know, get advantage um, of our students. Therefore, I think it is critical that all of us, including our students with disabilities, need to be, um, you know, protected and we got to think about ways how we could um, support these students in dealing with such um, safety issues, whether that's a, um, an internet or even after we come back to our uh, school later, the, the virus, the pandemic is over or, you know, um, and um, how we, our students can, um, can deal with um, such issues. The second um, point is for us to build our resources, you know, on where we are. So, you know, there are indeed quite a lot of resources available to, for example, allow um, equal access um, to um, students with disabilities. Not utilizing these makes the gap wider, the, you know, makes the inequity uh, to be more significant. So for example, Bookshare for uh, print disabilities or the World Digital Library, the Library of Congress, 
So there are many of these resources that are available currently that can support uh, parents and students. And therefore, um, I think it is important for us to develop our own library so that uh, we can uh, you know, correspond to um, the current needs, but also in the future needs as well. And finally, um, I think all of us um, need to uh, think about you know, how we could uh, best support uh, parents. You know? So um, from my previous ex uh, example of orientation and mobility, where how would you best teach the use of a, a white cane? I think one solution may be to uh, utilize and invite parents as our um, teachers, colleagues, and uh, have um, parents to take active roles in learning, and that I think it would be continued. So in doing so, um, establishing a, a fluid relationship between teachers and parents and providing a, a more infrastructure uh, that the uh, partnerships and you know, collaboration uh, can be um, you know, uh, best implemented. And I think that that's uh, uh, the responsibility of not only for teachers um, and parents, but also other entities that are involved in providing special education. So in doing so, um, the university, including the University of Arizona, can play a, a, a resourceful role in providing its expertise and share um, ideas and approaches um, with um, uh, various um, partners. So uh, I guess um, the, the disability and psychoeducational studies here at the university and other um, you know, departments in the College of Education um, can, can play a significant role in um, serving as a resource for the community. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Dr. Hong, for making that point, which I don't think has quite come up yet, you know, but I think absolutely, you know, the University of Arizona has, um, you know, just a breadth and scope of expertise among our faculty, our staff, and our students, and, and making sure that we're also being a resource to our local community, um, you know, should be a critical role that, that we're playing. Um, we actually have a question that's been posed by the audience, and, and maybe I'll be able to kind of garner some collective expertise among our panelists. And so I'll, I'll read it. And um, so they talk about being, um, you know, from a small rural school district without any planned online education infrastructure. And so they are certainly uh, interested in exploring perhaps maybe some possible partnerships with the university um, to be able to have access to, to something that's already perhaps created or gathered, um, allowing teachers, you know, who are forced perhaps um, to use uh, Google Classroom or, or other types of, of limited tools in the spring and are certainly looking forward, I think, ahead to the upcoming academic year and hoping that there's, there's more perhaps available and that can be shared. Are there any thoughts maybe, um, Dr. Holmes, Q, perhaps to share? I, I, I'll jump in. Um, one of the things that, that we've shifted to is, is um, looking at open educational resources that have been already curated. I think there's a lot in that space that has been vetted and actually rated in, um, in all the content areas that I think is an opportunity to move away from the traditional textbook model that, that you know, we have been kind of been kind of tied to for many decades. Um, and the curation of those, uh, those resources have been actually um, pretty surprising that as, as people go out there, I think there, there's definitely um, um, things that we're doing here at Sunnyside that I'd be willing to share with any educator or any um, um, administrative team that wants to look a little bit about the resources that, that we've kind of adopted over the last few years. But I think that, that idea of, of resources being open and not necessarily a purchase um, um, product, I think it's something that is really uh, alive and well now, and more so over the last few years where you've got high quality content that, that I think is accessible um, to help shape a, con a curriculum for teachers who are developing their own Google Classroom. So they're not trying to pull resources, rather they're pulling already curated resources that, that have been properly vetted. Uh, and to just build off of that, in the slide of creating agency, there was a background photo that was included, uh, Dan Kipler, uh, Sarah Travria, and um, Matt Rahir. 
um, including uh, ITEP directors, Dr. Valerie Shirley and Dr. Jeremy Garcia, who came together uh, to identify Wi-Fi hotspots and what needed to be placed out there to expand those Wi-Fi hotspots to reach parking lots so our students could work outside um, off their, their hotspots. So um, that's, that's awesome. That's a good start asking the question where to start and then secondly, not being afraid to reach out to ask for their, those resources. Uh, Dr. Kipler is out of UA Optics building. And then we have Matt Rahir. Um, he is an extension specialist uh, and he really helps tribal nations in rural areas um, get connected to the fiber. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for both offering those thoughts to uh, one of our participants' questions. Um, you know, I uh, definitely want to spend some, some good time making sure that we hear um, a little bit from, um, we'll, we'll go to you, Dr. Holmes, in terms of, you know, the future of teaching and learning, you know, given what we've just experienced and continue to experience in light of COVID-19, what would you say that's looking like? So I think it's, it's, it's really pushed a lot of us as educators to go back to thinking about the multiple modalities by which we offer instruction, right? Um, I think the multimodal classroom, um, although we had there were many conversations about that years back, is now resurfacing as a way of matching students to the modality in which they're most successful, right? And so then we begin to start thinking, how do you structure school around that so that you can actually meet the students where they feel their their learning is. I mean, we had the learning styles back in the day, and I just think there's a new space here for us to explore um, and maybe relooking at the way we do school. And equally important, um, it really also surfaced uh, a question around traditional grading practices. Um, I mean, we had big debates over what's going to happen, how do we grade, and, and really re-exploring this idea of competency-based learning uh, mastery learning, ways in which students can demonstrate their mastery in non-traditional ways that I think tend to continue to be, plague us and bog us down as we look at this space, right? There's, I go back to the, my original comment, which is that if we value this idea of completion, right, as a norm around what learning looks like, I don't think we're really practicing agency if it really add, isn't adding value, right? And so I, I think um, this is a unique opportunity right now to start thinking about that. I mean, much of it, unfortunately, is also driven by the values of a university system, right? Because you look at GPA and how that transfers into accessibility. And so there are some institutional barriers uh, that we have to think of collectively as, we, as partners with, with the university system to think about what's the right approach for this um, work and, and value system around grades as we move forward. Yeah, very important points. You know, I think we all have to definitely look within, um, you know, even uh, higher education institutions, uh, including the University of Arizona and across the nation, um, to think about, you know, uh, ways in which we, um, you know, have practiced and what those kind of normative standards and expectations have been around teaching and learning and really use this as an opportunity to, to pivot uh, and think a bit differently. So thank you for sharing. Q, perhaps you can uh, chime in and, and um, you know, share with us uh, just some brief thoughts on uh, the future of teaching and learning given what you just shared with us today. Um, it's, it's going to be a cleansing of the body, not only our individual body, but our bodies of our school structures, um, and that transpires into our mother earth, our land, um, to be able to do that. And holistic teachings around the fireplace teachings, as we all hear, education starts from the home. So really also equipping our families, um, our caretakers with the skills to engage with their little ones or whoever they're caring for, um, to help teach them, help them learn uh, along the way, but also, understanding and adopting that there are different forms of teaching and everybody is a teacher, everybody's an educator. 
Our little ones teach us, our babies teach us, just as much as our elders teach our babies and everybody in between. And being outside, you know, going back outside, um, of course, six feet apart these days, and really learning from our land, learning the mathematical concepts and the oral traditional story ties to those, so we can develop why those theories are worded the way they were they are in English, but also so we can have a recollection that's embedded in our brains and our hearts and our memories because it's tied to our traditional oral stories. And being able to do that as a true embodiment of, eh, of that relational dynamic with yourself, with your community and with your environment. And being able to do that will allow for strengthening collaborations there are collaborations happening now between tribal nations, indigenous peoples, communities, and institutions. But now that's going to be strengthened, the process of how to engage, how to differently engage. And a lot of those ways of differently engaging um, already is embedded in our traditional government systems um, as we navigate, as we make decisions moving forward together. And so everyone's a teacher. Um, and being able to know that we need the household there moving forward um, and to stop oppressing that type of educational structure. Uh, going back to Dr. Holmes' comment of the middle school, you know, a lot of teachers or even students um, maybe just want to go over high school and straight into uh, our um, over middle school and straight into high school. And so that made me think for us. In Navajo, we have our Kinalda puberty ceremony for both our male and our females. And that's around the time middle school. And that's a vital life stage for all of us where we need our family, our mentors. Because when we come together for that Kinalda, that ceremony, that knowledge is, comes together to help bring acknowledgement, awareness, and understanding to the individual, to the patient, this is why you're experiencing these emotions. This is one way to help navigate those um, emotions, how to apply it, to respond and not react. And so that allows them to be a stronger leader moving forward. Um, and what I'm really excited for is just the beauty that's going to come out of it. The type of strong indigenous curriculum that's embedded in our basketry to share knowledge about mathematical concepts or being able to educate about astronomy through our cosmos oral stories and so on and so forth. So it's exciting. It is scary. But that is life. And that is the way we navigate our circle of life. I can't. Yeah. Thank you, Q, so much for, for sharing. I, I think you actually even addressed one of the questions that came up uh, regarding the, the role of community partners in supporting uh, learning. And so thank you for acknowledging that. I do want to let uh, folks know who are joining us um, that we see your questions coming through. It is a lively chat. Um, and although we won't be able to get to all of your questions, just know that this webinar is recorded and will be made available for viewing after. Uh, we also uh, have the opportunity uh, to save these questions uh, uh, and then engage uh, in a response to you all. So I just wanna let you know that we see you and we love uh, the really thought provoking uh, questions that you're posing to us. Um, before we, uh, we just have uh, just a few more minutes, it's, it's always interesting to see how time flies when you're having fun. But I just wanna maybe get super, super quick, uh, you know, concluding remarks, maybe one last point that you'd like to make uh, with the audience before we close out here. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Hong, one quick thought. So I think the concept of back to the basic um, is important. The idea mandates that students with disabilities should have the same access to public education. Yeah. The, the pandemic creates a society that discrimination and exclusion uh, may impede uh, how um, the students with disabilities would appreciate the public school system. So therefore, I think it is important as a society as a whole that we would create um, this um, 
environment where it is inclusive, where um, it is supportive, and where it is, um, you know, resourceful to uh, all types of participants, regardless of um, uh, gender or any other types of, you know, um, poverty, you know, disabilities and whatnot, you know, any, any types of these marginalized um, aspects. With that regards, um, I think uh, we do have, uh, you know, huge homework uh, to reduce the gap, including the digital divide of the system. Yeah. Absolutely, Dr. Hong. Uh, inclusive and supportive are the two takeaways I just got from your message. So thank you. Um, Q, just any lasting concluding quick remarks that you'd like to make? Yeah. Um, we must let go of our colonized thinking and allow new thinking to take us to the next level, to the next phase of our journey. Um, so to all of you who take on the responsibility, responsibilities in your home, in your communities, in ceremony, our greatest thanks goes out to you um, because we're all working together, standing in collective solidarity. That's why those of you who are on the other side of the screen, you're chiming in. And for all of us to be supportive in creating new thinking, new ideas, um, and I'd like to share a thank you because you all ignite a special fire from the heart because you are all artists, whether you paint, dance, sing, draw, design, weave, print or write, you know, all our hats go off to each other because it's the magic and the hope that springs from each of our creativity that will allow us to express ourselves freely and help design a future of strength, beauty, and love for everybody, so. Thank you so much, Q, uh, definitely continuing us uh, to encourage us to, to uh, break free of what we know and uh, to consider new ways of doing things. Uh, Dr. Holmes, any last concluding remarks before we log off? I think just um, we need to push against this narrative that we want to get back to normal again yeah. because um, normal was not good. Right, and so there's an opportunity with everything that's going on in the nation to really address some institutional inequities um, that occur in all of our institutions. And so I, I think um, normalcy is not what we're looking towards, it's, it's evolution, right, to something better than what we left. And I think there's an opportunity in this crisis to, to do right by, by our, our children and, and you know, better our systems. Absolutely. So I just want to leave and say thank you to our amazing panelists, colleagues, um, and to our audience for joining us today and your level of engagement and interest with us. Um, certainly there will be follow-up uh, via email with a recording as well as uh, connections. We will certainly be making some connections with you all regarding resources that might be helpful, um, as well as learning, of course, more about the College of Education and some of the expertise and talents there as well as across our, our university. Uh, I wish you well. Please stay healthy um, out there and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.